There was a monk debate recently entitled, Be it resolved that the mainstream media cannot be trusted. And the monk debates are about the highest level of debate that we have in Canada, so this is not nothing. Be it resolved that the mainstream media cannot be trusted. Unsurprisingly, the yay side won, but as a bonus, it won by the largest margin of any monk debate in its entire 28 year history. That is something. I, th I think I'm going to start a file called the, the Tide is Turning file. You know, just the, for examples of this, uh, uh, there's a CBC article that was talking about how not even they could give, get a list of the billionaires or millionaires or whoever it was that got so much money from the government. If the CBC starts uh, criticizing the Trudeau government, you know, the tide is turning. <clears throat> More troubling, though, is the fact that the debate was over whether or not the mainstream could be trusted in the Western world as a whole, not just in Canada. The answer to that second part was answered by the fact that the possibility that the Canadian media might be trustworthy generally did not come up. And certainly nobody was foolish enough to suggest that it was trustworthy in its coverage of the Freedom Convoy. In fact, it was argued otherwise which the so-called journalists insisted on calling the so-called trucker convoy. Here's how Douglas Murray put it. Uh, Douglas Murray is becoming more of a swollen head than uh, he was when I first really got interested in what he was doing with the strange death of Europe. Uh, but he's a wicked intelligent person, so this is how he put it. The Canadian mainstream media acted as an all-men chorus of the Canadian gover government, Murray argued. Now, why is this rancid? So utterly, utterly rancid and corrupt. Because in this country, your media, your mainstream media, is funded by the government. And I would add blatantly so. That there's no, they don't hide that at all. That's the CBC and every other mainstream uh, journalistic organization. A journalist from the nay side revealed a little more than she's realized, I suspect, in her defense of the mainstream media when she said this. Um, I showed up at the Ottawa protest kind of expecting the sort of things that I've seen at Donald Trump rallies. This is a woman working for the New York Times. Not exactly a right-wing rag. I showed up at the Ottawa protest kind of expecting the sort of things that I'd seen at Donald Trump rallies, at various events, at, or at various even further right-wing events, and didn't find it. I was really quite astonished, and I told my editors that this is what I found, and they said, great, that's more interesting than what we thought you were going to find. And it was more interesting, she said. So what I don't get... so. She's arguing for the credibility of the New York Times, right? Um, but she's certainly not arguing for the credibility of the CBC. That's what I mean when I say she... Um, she re revealed a little bit more than she thought, I think. How about this one? <clears throat> Pat Morris, supervisor of the Ontario Provincial Operations Intelligence Bureau. Pat Morris, supervisor of the Ontario Provincial Operations Intelligence Bureau, a guy who would know about threats, said his test said this in his testimony that OPP found no credible intelligence of threats. In terms of producing intelligence, and even said that the lack of violent crime was shocking in Ottawa, with only a few charges laid for violent crimes most of them against police officers. And there's that woman that smashed a, uh, a protester in the face with a uh, microphone a while ago. That was a violent crime. So isn't it quite amazing that <clears throat> supervisor of the Ontario Provincial Operations Intelligence Bureau said that it was shocking how little violence there was. And this is key. And I saw him say this. 
Morris also said he found it problematic to hear certain identified politicians and members of the media claim that the protests were being influenced by Russia or American sources or even President Trump when he never saw proof of that. And he would know. He's the guy that would know. The lack of violence was shocking. Uh, that statement is in itself almost shocking. Presumably what he meant by that is that such a is that in such a large group of protesters, protesting over such a long period of time, he would have expected serious criminality to have occurred. Sorry, my stuttering is coming from both the, me and the way that this is written. My apologies. What is even more interesting than that, and that he found the protest much less radical than she expected. I'm sorry, I'm talking about the, going back to the New York Times writer. What is even more interesting that she found the protest much less radical than she expected, which goes toward the argument that it did not need to be violent, is disrupted, is the question of where she got the idea that the pro protest would be worse than it was. The CBC, the mainstream media, perhaps? What do you think? A compliant media that will do lying for you, paid for by taxpayers who, generally speaking, hate you, must be any sadistic authoritarian's wet dream. Although more satisfying than simply brainwashing them into submission. Um, so I wasn't going to do this right away, but uh, this the sadism angle I think is you you can't understand what's happening. You know this entire mess, whatever you want to call it. I think you know what I'm talking about by now. Uh, <clears throat> check a. A YouTube video called Christy Freeland, I'm Not Speaking, and it's by, the channel name is Justin Trudeau Corruption. Okay, uh, Larry Brock, conservative MP in committee, and you have to watch the committees. You have to go to um, this guy's garage. If, if you don't watch committee meetings, you don't know what's happening in Canada. I don't think so. I don't think it's possible. Um, so anyway, you can find this... Uh, interview or this this questioning really I mean uh, what you've got here is an opportunity for uh, politicians to force other politicians to actually answer questions that's what committees for and that's where she was we're finally going to get to the bottom of some things <clears throat> so Larry Brock conservative MP he said on March 21st 2002 22 the CBC, without any ex explanation, without any apology, without any clarity, retract, retracted their, their story regarding the funding of the protest. You were aware of that, Freeland. This is in the middle of a conversation. Anyway, Freeland. Again, I'm not speaking for the CBC. I'm speaking for herself, I suppose. And Brock interrupted her. I'm not asking you for to, to speak for the CBC. I'm asking, were you informed that the CBC retracted the story? And the story was about uh, terrorism funding and money laundering in those GoFundMe accounts. The CBC reported it on it, and um, Christy Freeland used it as, as a, a source of information. She talked about it in the House of Commons. You'll get to this. We'll get to this. Anyway, I'm not asking for you to speak for the CBC. I'm asking, were you informed that the CBC retracted the story, the false story about foreign funding and donations to the convoy? <clears throat> Christy Freeland. Again, again, Mr. Brock, however it is she talks. Like, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Like, does she have another tone? I've never heard another tone. It's always, you know, the Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Brock. I don't believe that the CBC is interrogated here. I believe it is the government. Okay, so now I think this is sadistic because he's asking her an important question. He's asking her, did she, was she aware that the, uh, the story that you based your comments on had been retracted? And she's either, she's pretending that she doesn't understand what he says. So she's either uh, so stupid that she doesn't understand what he's saying right? Uh, or how much agony that would cause people because we've been listening to their non-answers for years now. Like I, I wouldn't, I'm not above thinking, 
Like at some point, we're going to have to start pleading with these people. Like maybe it'll work. Whatever works is okay with me. Like, please, can you please just come back down to earth? You know what I'm asking you. Answer the question. And so that's what Brock, Larry Brock said. He said, just answer the question, Minister Freeland. Were you aware, yes or no? It's a simple question, Freeland. I don't have the article. And Freeland says, uh, I don't have the article before me, and I'm not here to answer questions about the CBC. Uh, okay, he wasn't asking questions about the CBC. He was asking whether you not knew that the CBC had withdrawn the article when you made the comment that money laundering and terrorism was involved in the trucker convoy. That's what he's asking you. So Brock says, the deputy prime minister, the most senior cabinet minister, is not prepared to accept whether the CBC retracted a false story. Freeland. I don't speak for the CBC, sir. Uh, Larry, uh, Brock, you relied upon that story from the CBC and shared your concerns with Canadians regarding the terrorism funding and money laundering. Your words, correct? And Freeland says, like, this is when it just gets into the point where you're just thinking, you know, can I take this anymore? She says, I want to be very clear, right? One of those ones. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I've uh, lost... Let me be very clear. My principal concern when it comes to the illegal occupation and the illegal blockades is the economic harm, which was exaggerated. During the whole time that those borders were closed, trade between the United States and Canada went up. Most people don't know that, of course, because mainstream media wouldn't tell them, but that's true. It would have gone up more than it did with, with the blockades, I'm sure. Uh, but compared to the year previously, it had gone up. And there was a kerfuffle about that too. Like whether they had, when they complained about the economic harm, whether they actually had any, any figures to deal with. To, you know, what figures were they relying on? And they didn't have any. Anyway, so she says, my principal concern when it comes to the legal occupation and the legal blockades is the economic harm. That's our response to a series of questions designed to uh, figure out whether or not she knew that the CBC was false when she talked about it in the House of Commons and probably in other places. And she didn't seem afraid, right? She didn't seem afraid. Uh, she seemed perfectly confident seeing this. And uh, Larry Brock is a pretty intimidating big guy, but you can see the pain in his, in his head. Like, I think this is a big part of it. Do they actually know the pain that they're causing us? You know, it, it's not nice to hear about um, late onset gender confu uh, dysphoria, is it? Because you're hearing about adolescent girls having their breasts removed. They're becoming infertile, right? That hurts. And I think, I really actually think that they know it. Uh, how could they not know it? Like, would you expect that human beings wouldn't understand that hearing about this would cause pain? <clears throat> so Brock says, let me be very clear, Minister Freeland. Your words several times in the House of Commons referred to terrorism funding and money laundering. Are you saying that you didn't use those words? Freeland. I'm speaking here today, and I'm talking about the, sorry, talking about the central motivation of our very seriousness. That's what she said. I'm here speaking about the central motivation of our very seriousness. Okay, Brooke. And I'm here to ask you questions. And I expect, unlike question period, I expect a response. He should have said answer. I expect an answer. You, you see these things going on, like actually in, in this one that I'm talking about, I'm not speaking or whatever it's called. I, I provided it earlier. Um, someone will say, uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, can we deal with this situation? Because this, is, this person isn't answering the question. And then somebody on that side will pipe up and say, she is answering the question. Well, no, like, let's sort it out, okay? If I ask you what color was the truck 
and you say the fish jumped off the bridge, that's not an answer, right? Like, let's strip it down. Let's get down to answering questions. I mean, that has been torture. Who hasn't been tortured by listening to them not answer questions? I know that this is a, a new uh, angle that I'm taking on this, but no, I, I think that the sadism angle is really... I think it gets to the heart of it. I don't think you can understand it without understanding this. And I'm going to uh, use that theme uh, a lot of times <clears throat> because I've realized that uh, I'm not going to be done with these uh, little presentations anytime soon. So he says, do you recall using the words terrorism funding and money laundering in the house and reporting it outside the house? Yes or no? Uh, Freeland says, I believe that if we were in a court of law, this would be called badgering the witness. And she actually looks smug. She actually, I think she's stupid. Honestly, I think she's stupid. Uh, and so it went on for like another two or three minutes. Listen to it if you could bear it. I mean, it's truly sickening, just truly horrifying that anybody could be so disrespectful to the, to the institutions, so indolent. So ridiculous. And she didn't feel like that she was on the hot seat. I didn't get the sense that she, that she felt that this was important in any way whatsoever. And that's probably because uh, Canadians don't listen to committee hearings. Um, this guy's garage. He, he posts them. Excellent channel. <clears throat> Okay, I'll go back to the, <clears throat> the thing. Here's how the member of European Parliament, Christine Anderson, and this woman is kind of touring around Canada now, talking to uh, you know people that are interested in freedom and everything, all and like that. But um, what's that guy's? Um, that guy's name, the Jewish guy that lives in Montreal. He was a lawyer, you know. Talks too fast. He's got too much energy. What's that guy's name? What is that guy's name? Nobody here knows his name. Anyway. Um, yeah, he was talking about it. God, I can't remember his name. This is ridiculous. Uh, anyway. Here's how the member of the European Parliament, Christine Anderson... Okay, now I know what I wanted to say about the guy whose name I can't remember. Um, he talked to her. It's a Canadian, you know, one of my guys. Uh, as hippy-dippy a guy as you could get. I mean, just have a look at him. This guy whose name I can't remember. You know what I mean. Lawyer turned YouTuber, lives in Montreal, talks too fast. How could anybody not know who he is? Anyway, so he had an uh, interview with her, and he was kind of like, you know, what are you doing in Canada talking to us about our politics? Um, anyway, I, I, she's probably making money. And she is a bit of a wingnut, I'll admit that. Anyway, like, you know, at what point in history did anybody ever say anything like this about a Canadian prime minister? And they're saying it all over the place now. Like, let's just face it. It's all over the place. She said... Prime Minister openly admires a, base, a Chinese basic dictatorship who tramples on fundamental rights by persecuting and criminalizing his own citizens as terrorists just because they dared stand up to his perverted concept of democracy. Uh, he should not be allowed to speak in this house at all. Uh, and one of them actually said, please uh, spare us your presence. Three of them stood up and talked to him. And more and more people are going to be standing up and talking to him. He can't go anywhere without being protested now. Like, there's a momentum here now. And the tide has turned. And that's, in a way, a frightening thing as well. You don't want people uh, too angry, pushing for change. Like, I agree, it's kind of scary. Uh, but when you look at the quality of the people that are at the forefront of this thing, you know, uh, you can't do much better. There's some, uh, you know, supremely interesting people. Like, I'm listening to John Anderson. I think that he was the uh, Prime Minister of Australia for a while. 
Um, there's a lot of people. Everybody knows this. Anyway, it's surprising how many people say truly horrific things like this about our Prime Minister. And many of the people you hear saying such things are past or current citizens of authoritarian regimes who understand that the totalitarian nature is sadistic. To varying degrees, but it is always sadistic. Which uh, fits back in with my, th with my theme here, I think. Uh, that seems very plausible to me, but uh, C.S. Lewis, I wonder how many people even know who he is, conceived of it differently. <clears throat> Tell me if this doesn't ring a bell. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who to torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. They may be more likely to go to heaven yet, or at the same time, likelier to make a hell of earth. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a Christian. That's a totally Christian uh, interpretation of what they're doing. Um, I don't think that at, at this point that they think that they're doing any good. How could they possibly imagine that they're doing any good at this point? So there's another interesting quote I dug up. We see him here. We see him there. We see him damn near everywhere. Justin Trudeau has got to have Canada's biggest carbon footprint. Yeah. Do you think? <laughs> Jesus. Since May 1st, by calculations based on his official daily itinerary and an internet distance between two points gap, he has flown more than 38,000 uh, kilometers. That's just 2,000 kilometers less than the Earth's circumference. Around the world in 38 days. They could make a movie. That's, that's, that would be a great movie. All the different uh, dignitaries and higher-ups, corrupt, people he must have uh, met, parties, what they did at parties. Just imagine, <clears throat> that's a good idea, make a movie about him traveling 38,000 kilometers in 38 days. Oh, I see. So it's, he traveled 1,000 kilometers a day. <clears throat> and so often to be met with protests. I mean, uh, when he went to England, the response was just vicious. <clears throat> anyway, So we finally get to the Emergencies Act. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I set this up as a kind of a, a kind of a debate, and I proposed that uh, his invocation of the Emergencies Act was really uh, unjustified. Okay. Trudeau's invocation of the Emergencies Act was unjustified, and only through a perverse and corrupt interpretation of events and laws could anyone argue otherwise for reasons that I will try to outline beginning with the most obvious, which is that the Emergency Act is the strongest power that a government has for depriving Canadians, however temporarily, of their fundamental rights and freedoms. Both conventional wisdom and the Act itself say that it should only be used when an emergency seriously endangers the lives, health, or safety of Canadians. The trucker convoy was not seriously endangering the lives, health, or safety of, con of Canadians. It, and it's going to be interesting what happens when the Rouleau report comes out. There was, he was going to give the the, his judgment to uh, Trudeau a month early before the rest of us got it. What for? Uh, so he could suggest changes, Right or so that he could prepare himself for the onslaught that's to come. Maybe Judge Rouleau was taking pity on him. I don't know, but like it's the, if he comes back and says that it was justified, that's, there's going to be really angry people around because there's no, just, it's inconceivable that it was justified. It should only be used when an emergency seriously endangers the lives, health, or safety of Canadians. That's the law. And cannot be effectively dealt with under any other law of Canada. 
and it was being dealt with with other laws in Canada. The truckers were moving out already. Okay, so I'll just go through this. I jump ahead too far. According to CSIS, our highest level security organization, no such threat existed, or at least that is what David Vignon, CSIS. CSIS director told Cabinet originally, and this is so weird. I don't understand why this isn't talked about. Um, this had been a cornerstone of critics' accusation that the threshold had not been met, is that David Vigneault had gone to the Cabinet and told them that it hadn't been met. So, our, so we figure, well, you know, that, that kind of settles it, doesn't it? But then towards the end of the public hearings, it, that had been going on for about uh, seven weeks at that point, and the committee hearings for months. Towards the end of the public hearings, when things were going very badly for the Liberals, it was claimed that Vignon had, in a private meeting, told Trudeau that he would be justified in invoking the act and was advised to proceed. Now that strains credulity. If such a, no a conversation had actually taken place, the Lib Liberal government would have had nothing to lose and everything to gain from revealing to the public because it would have helped justify the act from the beginning of the hearing. It could have had the boss of this kind of stuff say, yeah, I told the cabinet that it hadn't been, that the threshold had not been met, but privately I had told Trudeau that it had been met and that he should go away, go along with it. Like, who's going to believe that? Our criticism of the invocation was based largely on the fact that the, he had told the cabinet that it wasn't justified. And now he's saying that, you know, all that time ago, he had actually told them in private that it was. So why wouldn't Trudeau have, uh, have shared that? It's, it makes absolutely no sense. <clears throat> um, okay, if he had told Trudeau that, if such a conversation had actually taken place, the Liberal government would have nothing to lose and everything to gain from revealing that to the public because it would have helped justify the act from the beginning of the hearing. The public had a right to that information. The fact that it came out after months of committee testimony and weeks of commission testimony is extremely suspicious. To my, to my knowledge, no explanation has been provided to explain that curious state of affairs. And to be honest, I haven't heard many questions. Nobody's asking, why, why did that happen? Okay, here's another curious thing. David Lametti claimed that there was a body of legal opinion that supported the broader inter interpretation of the Emergencies Act used by the Liberals. Fair enough. That would be useful, but when asked to share those opinions, Lametti refused claiming solicitor-client privilege. So what I'm saying is, is that um, just by a common sense or a traditional interpretation of the Emergencies Act, what they did was unjustified. So David Lamenti comes along and says, no, there's another uh, interpretation that, that we had, right? That made it, act so it actually is justified. But then he didn't provide the interpretation. And when asked, he said he refused claiming solicitor-client privilege. We're therefore being asked to accept the legal opinion with no reason given for it. The very least that Lemity could have provided would have been the relevant literature. Short of that, it is reasonable to assume that the literature does not exist or that it does not say what he claims that it says. What are, you, what are we supposed to think? Even the NDP is suspicious. Solicitor-client privilege is indeed an important principle, but under the statutes governing inquiries in other jurisdictions, jurisdictions, sorry, it is at times clearly spelled out that professional secrecy cannot be invoked as a shield to stop the commission from getting all of the evidence that it needs. Otherwise, why hold an inquiry at all? The legality of the government's action was the crux of what Rulo had to decide, and Lametti was being singularly unhelpful. Yeah, that's one way to put it. It has a nice ring to it, singularly unhelpful. And that's from uh, none other than Tom McClare. <clears throat> no police force, including the Ottawa police, had asked for the invocation, presumably because they had been working with the Freedom Convoy for weeks to keep the protest safe and had a good idea how to bring the protest to a peaceful end. Like, how many people knew that the police and the truckers 
were in communication the whole time, and that's how they managed to pull off such a safe event. Uh, <clears throat> trucks had already begun, begun moving out of the residential areas before the act was invoked. All it took to get to that point was for Ottawa to send a negotiator who later said that the protests were pacified simply by having someone, anyone, in a position of influence listen to them, something that liber the Liberals steadfastly refused to do. In the days preceding, the police, having seen the success that Ottawa had achieved through dialogue, had a plan to increase the number of liaison officers to open up channels of communication and begin a process of negotiation and reconciliation. Trudeau rejected the plan to deploy more liaison officers, calling it no plan at all. Okay, so the, those guys are all getting tired. They're actually starting to move trucks out. And uh, the idea that you're going to send uh, police in to talk to these guys, form rela better relationships, talk about how to cool the whole thing down, was no plan at all. Which is curious because he advised people to read the plan, but also claimed to have not read it himself. You know, it's just, you know, this ups, upside down uh, world we live in. When the plan was made available to the commission, it was highly redacted, which means that we'll never be able to see for ourselves the plan that he rejected, having never read it himself. You know, you just come to these uh, blind corners, you know. <clears throat> There's no way to wrap your head around it, really. Just the end of it. Uh, we will never be able to see for ourselves the plan that he rejected, having never read it himself. <clears throat> the refusal to engage the protesters, the insults and the invocation itself seemed designed specifically to provoke a violent reaction. In the commission hearings, he said that he supported protests, but not protests that demanded change. <laughs> which is curious, because he supported protests in Iran and China, which demanded change. When BLM protested in front of the parliament, he literally got on, his, on one knee to express solidarity with the cause. And that was early in the uh, epidemic when, you know, it was all so dangerous and all that. You have to wonder about an organization that views an act of supplication as an act of solidarity, getting down on your knees. Why that? Why that? We were supposed to get down on our knees. You know, there's a lot of people, they don't get down on their knees. Especially not for a movement that caused more damage to black people than anything in the last 50 years. You know, at some point it becomes too much. <clears throat> uh, you have to wonder about an organization that views an act of supplication as an act of solidarity, especially when that organization helped cause riots that negatively impacted black communities across the United States. BLM was a tragedy for black people in the United States, but Trudeau got on his knees for that movement. For the truckers, he had only insults. Let's do a little bit of a comparison with Aboriginal protests. The statues were tied with ropes and hauled to the ground during a demonstration over the death of Indigenous children at residential schools. The statue of Queen Victoria, larger and placed prominently near the main entrance to the legislature grounds, had its head removed. I think, believe this was in Saskatchewan. The head was recovered the next day from nearby Assiniboine River. And I don't know if this is the one that I saw, but I saw them, like, it's just a, you know, you can, you almost want to puke when you see it. Uh, it was one of the queens, it was, um, I think it might have been Queen Elizabeth. These nut jobs show up, right? And I think that there were at least as many police officers as there were protesters. So the police watched them do it. The police watched them throw the rope around uh, Queen Elizabeth, who I think, you know, it's gonna look pretty bad around the world what we did there, isn't it? You know what we allowed, right? I saw it. So they, they throw the ropes around this thing. They yank the, the statue down, the head pops off, and there's this kind of like, you know, they, they knew that they're supposed to, uh, you know, be so thrilled, you know, they're so filled with pain and anguish over the negative treatment they'd suffered. And finally, you know, they'd broken down the boundaries and ripped down this symbol of oppression that, you know, would have been like glorious, right? But it was kind of like, 
There was a moment. Um, uh, okay, let's just say that there were some whoops and hollers. I was like, okay, whoopee. You know, Queen Elizabeth head rolls down the block. You know, I saw it happen. It's on YouTube. You can find it. Can you take a break? No. Can you take it down a Okay, a smaller statue of Queen Elizabeth located close to the Lieutenant Governor's residence was toppled but left hardly intact. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they didn't pop Queen Elizabeth's head off. It was Queen Victoria, but they did drag it down. And, uh, sorry, but they didn't look like Aboriginal people to me, not many of them. <clears throat> so that was in response to the residential schools. So let's recall that to date, not a single body has been exhumed. Let's also re recall that during the time that the residential schools were open, most of the medical advances that keep people alive today did not exist. Canada experienced two world wars, a major economic depression, and like the rest of the world, the Spanish flu. In the context of a discussion of the justifiable... Okay, uh, forget that little babble. 68 Christian churches in Canada have been vandalized, burned down, or desecrated since the announcement last month of the apparent discovery of graves found near a residential school in Kamloops, BC. Like, it's almost like as if people didn't think that people didn't die back then. Uh, I mean, they're talking about there's 250 uh, burial sites out of a place, outside of a place where they were known to have been buried. And that's stretching over like 80 years, 230 people who had attended that place died. Like what number would you expect? Would you expect none? You know, uh, it's absolutely preposterous. Uh, since then, three other First Nations have announced similar findings of burial sites located near formal residential schools. In response to these announcements, far-left radicals have used this opportunity as an excuse to terrorize Catholic and other Christian communities by ta targeting churches. Christians are the most... Um, um, what's the word? Uh, persecuted uh, religious group in the world and have been for a long time. I mean, especially in the Middle East. Come on. <clears throat> 25 churches across the country have been lit on fire in the past two months. Many of them have been completely destroyed. Here's the transcript from a committee hearing in which CSIS was questioned about not, in, about not including Aboriginal activists in its 2021 threat assessment. It was provided by True North and contains some commentary from them. So... The 2021 threat assessment had not one, not one mention of the fact that this number of churches had been vandalized and burned down. Churches that were important to other Aboriginal people, by the way. So officials with CSIS refused to give a straight answer as to why the church burnings were not included in its 2021 threat assessment report. Like, you just keep coming up against these walls, right? You, it, you come up against it and you go, boom. You can't find any way to make any sense of it whatsoever. There's, there's just no sense in it. I just find it ex interesting because you do have extensive stuff in your report about ideologically motivated extremism, religiously motivated extremism, politically motivated extremism, and yet 30 churches being burned down in Canada last year didn't merit a mention, said Lloyd. This is a conservative MP. Can you tell us if CSIS has ever reached out to show support and solidarity with the 30 church communities that were burned down in Canada in 2021? 20, like, wouldn't it be nice if the people who lived in those communities could have some sense that CSIS was looking for the people who burned them down? So the answer, what I will say is that the service is extremely concerned, blah, blah, blah. No, they didn't. 
Lloyd responded with reference to the Morinville Church file, fire, which saw the Alberta community's century-old Catholic church burn down in June. It would be nice to have a statement of at least concern for those communities from CSIS, considering the fact that at 4 a.m. in the morning in my town of Morinville, 50 people had to be evacuated from their homes because a church was burned down, and there was a massive threat that a senior's home apartments were going to be burned to the ground, Lloyd said. This could have been one of the highest mass, ca mass, mass casualty terrorist events on Canadian soil in our modern history, and yet it doesn't seem to have merited a single mention by your security service. So I want to put that on record. Uh, so recall that many of these churches were well-loved and some were the most beautiful buildings in town. Once again, activists fighting for Aboriginal causes negatively affected Aboriginal people. They did manage to increase the level of fear in the country, however, and fear is a great way to destroy social cohesion and provoke hatred and conflict. Conflict increases the chances of political violence. And violence, especially in the absence of a reasonable debate, frequently necessitates, necessitates repressive measures. And there imagine the left would be the instigators of that repression and not the victims. So that's what it's about. They're happy to see this sort of conflict because they want to see some reaction from, uh, let's put it frankly, from Whitey. And then they could, they'd come forward and um, protect us all from Whitey. From conservatives, not all the, the people who are on my side of this thing are white, that's for sure. But you get the idea. At some point, Canadians are going to have to recognize that they're stuck between cultural Marxist universities and radical Aboriginal activists who are willing, for example, to go on an arson spree during the worst heat wave in Canadian history, and in response to slanderous news articles claiming that a mass grave had been discovered, when in fact what it had happened was that a grave site had been lo located, one that Aboriginal people had already known existed. The graveyard had been open for decades through the Great Depression, uh, World Wars One, One and Two, Spanish flu, and flu, and operated for much of its time before many of the most important medical medical uh, advances that have been made today. Of course, there was a graveyard. They didn't even listen to the Aboriginal people there. I heard Aboriginal people say that they didn't listen to rank and file Aboriginal people when they decided to bring the Canadian rail system to its knees to protest pipeline that most Aboriginal people wanted. What were the Mohawks doing getting involved anyway? They were thousands of miles from their own territory. Western political philosophy is predicted on the supremacy of individual rights over collective rights because the pursuit of collective rights leads to conflict and abuse. This group gets this. The other day doesn't based this, this group gets this. The other group doesn't based on identity. Aboriginal people are being colonized again, this time by cultural Marxists coming out of the educational system. He who controls the past controls the future. 